try to be heard through this mask, and later on I'll take it off briefly. But I wanted to welcome you all and thank you for coming and being a comfort to the family and uh, uh, recognizing this special soul that lived among us for all those years. And she loved us also, and we loved her. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to be sharing this service with uh, Wayne Spangenberg, who was also uh, her pastor. And Deborah McGee is going to be taking an important part as well in the music. Please be seated. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Man is born of a woman, and is of few days, and full of trouble. And he cometh like a flower, and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow, and continueth not. If one die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee, and thou wilt have the desire to the work of thine hands. And then this, from the Apostle Paul. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our precious Lord, we are gathered in this place as uh, family and friends. We are gathered in this place, Lord, because we we desire to comfort one another. Apparently, Father, we desire to remember sweet, precious memories of one that we've lived with for a long time. But dear Lord, this is not something new or secret to you because she was your child and we are your children and where we are gathered together in your name, you are in our midst and Lord, you are here to comfort us. You are here to speak to our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, you are here to remind us of the great and precious promises that you have given, that in Christ we shall indeed live again, and we shall be gathered together as family and friends again to rejoice in you for all that you have done for us. But Lord, right now, we need your Holy Spirit to bathe us in the quietness of heart and peace. Dear Lord, we need your tender touch to remind us that all is well because you are with us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for holding us to your heart. And may we feel your power and grace among us. And Lord, as the days go on, give us a song in our hearts again. Remind us that you are the author of all things. You are the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your great and mighty love for us. Shelter us in your peace, I pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Maxine asked that we sing the music that's here listed on the program. So we're going to have a congregational hymn. You can remain seated while you sing. Um, the words are on the back 
of the bullet that you hold in your hand, so you don't need to be looking to find the number in the hymnal. It's right there. And so we'll just go ahead and sing this at the direction of the pianist, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. my privilege about 30 some years ago to uh, be pastor of this church in this district and then we left for a long time and have retired here since. A lot of things have changed here. A lot of people have changed here but you know people change they get older but you know those those with good hearts just have good hearts and stay that way. They just do. I thank God for that. Maxine Fay Collie Hines was born April the 13th, 1932. 
In 1932, the United States and the world were in the midst of the Great Depression. In 1932, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. In 1932, the Radio City Music Hall first opened in New York City. In 1932, Wyatt Carraway was the first woman to be elected to the Senate. And Maxine Faye Colley, who would later be known so affectionately as Maxine Hines, would be born on April the 13th of that year in Greenville, North Carolina. Later on, they moved to Wilmington, where she graduated from New Hanover High School in 1950. As the year before I was even born. Hmm. Seems like just yesterday. <laughs> You'll understand that when you get older. As fate, or rather divine intention, would have it, Maxine and Robert J. Hines, more famously known to us affectionately as Bob, met here in Wilmington in the summer of 1964. They fell madly in love. I think about that, I wonder if the courtship was as hot as the uh, Wilmington summer because um, it was in that summertime, but nonetheless, they tied the knot. They said their I do's in 1965 and made a promise that would last for 50 years. Boy, admire that. 55, I got it wrong. 55? That's even better. <laughs> what a testimony. What a testimony. Well, Maxine was here in the Wilmington area. She uh, worked in a bank. Not sure what bank that was, but she worked in a bank for a while. I guess that's following up some of the family now, I understand. <laughs> she worked in daycare. Um, of course, you know, it'll probably be there that she honed a lot of her skills because she loved children and was so good with them. Later on, she uh, got her some training, became a certified nurse's assistant, her CNA, and worked with that for a while. And then as time went on, she, uh, of course, continued to take care of her family, her community, and her church. Hmm. Bob and Maxine have been devoted Seventh-day Adventist Christians for more years than most of us can remember. And they serve this congregation with devotion and faithfulness for what also seems forever. Maxine and Bob are sort of um, fixtures here. You know, they just kind of are. You come in and they're here. You go and they're here. You need something and they're here. <laughs> Someone has something going on and they're here. Um, and though we are so pleased that Bob is still here, Maxine will, his partner will certainly be missed, certainly be missed. In her service for Christ, she has given herself tirelessly for her church, for her family, and for her community, just as she gave herself selfishly and lovingly to her family and all those who loved her. When I wrote that, I started reflecting a little bit. I thought, well, it's kind of hard to think of anyone she didn't love or try to love. Isn't that true? Yeah. <laughs> She's just one of those kind of people that would just kind of reach out and snatch you, you know? Hmm. The impression that I hear from most of Mac, about most, about mostly about Maxine from her family and friends is this, and this is a quote. She spent her life putting everyone else first, a true caregiver, in every sense of the word. A gracious and gentle Southern lady, to be sure. But don't confuse her kindness with weakness or predictability. Maxine was a pretty tough lady. Mm -hmm. She could be serious to the point that in a, in a heartbeat she could surprise you with the most unexpected things. Just as her family um, can attest to you in things like, um, I guess they used to like to play family games, Uno, the Wheel of Fortune. And I was told, don't get too complacent because in a moment, 
she could get really serious. <laughs> And she could get, I get really competitive, and she could let you know pretty clearly where things ought to be. <laughs> she was a lady of surprises, I think. She had a great sense of humor. She could really make you wonder, though. She was good friends with someone that used to attend this church by the name of Maurice Dixon. I don't know if anybody, I guess some of you probably remember Maurice. He was an interesting kind of a guy fun guy, crazy kind of a guy, affectionately known here as Mo, but very good friends with Bob and Maxine. When those two were together, it was an event ready to happen, for sure. In fact, here is one of his little accounts um, that is now one of those moments that will be forever remembered by family, probably more especially, and perhaps us after this. I'm going to share two little stories he has. I think you'll appreciate them. He says, I am Mo Dixon. I went to church here a few years ago. Um, Maxine and Bob were my good friends. We had some great times together. But one year we rented a house at Lake Junaluska for camp meeting. Maxine had bought some underwear for Robert. The only problem was that they were the wrong size. In fact, they were like 10 sizes too big. So having get a little chuckle out of that, the two of them, Mo and Maxine, decided to walk around the camp meeting, she in one leg of the two big underwear, <laughs> and he in the other leg of the two big underwear, and they walked around the camp and were singing, and sort of got sort of loud, you know, as they were singing and marching around in the two big, I know that's pretty funny, isn't it? You could laugh. I mean, that's, that's, I can, I'm trying to see that picture. And with Mo, I can see that picture. <laughs> it's hilarious. Not untypical, but hilarious. So they're making so much noise, singing and walking around. Somebody called the security on them, and they almost threw them off the campus. We went back to the house. We fell down on the floor, laughing so hard that Maxine said she laughed hard enough that she, well, you know, sometimes ladies, when you laugh too hard, what happens then? <laughs> Camp meeting, as you can imagine, was never the same again. <laughs> that was her, you know? You, you wouldn't always guess that about her, but it was there. <laughs> There's another thing he shares. One other time, he says, we were living at the Holden Beach and we invited Bob and Maxine down for Sabbath dinner. This was when Hurricane Diana was off the coast for about a week. I remember that. We, everybody prepared for this hurricane, went out there and sat out, just sat out there, just sat out there, sat out there, sat out there, sat out, didn't come, didn't go, didn't really rain, I just sat out there. <laughs> Finally, it went away, which was nice. Yeah, that was, that was kind of funny. Anyway, it just sat out there, and so they came down. Uh, we didn't, we didn't have much to eat at the house because, you know, things were tight for them. He was a, a literature evangelist. Uh, the, store sh the shelves in his community were pretty bare, and the shelves in the house were pretty bare, too. So Maxine, as is Maxine, came down and had a whole bag of groceries to bring with them to share. He says, as he reflects, I'm not sure how that actually happened, but it sounds like, he says, I don't think she ever knew that we ate all her food. If she did, she never said this, never said a thing. This is just one of the way Maxine was. Bring down the food, eat it all themselves, that's okay, because that's why I'm here. And he, and he closes with this. She was really a good friend. Kind of makes you think about people a little bit. It's kind of funny. People are complex. People are multifaceted. I never saw this personally, but I told Maxine, I was told, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm told that Maxine would, I'm trying to imagine this because I never saw this. I was told that Maxine could break into dance at the drop of a hat. Is that, did she have this little dance? Did you ever see that? Ah, I see some of you snickering out there. 
She had this little banshee. I never saw that, you know. And also, um, I would have loved to have seen that. She also had this little way of really cracking a smile when she, for everybody else, when she broke into her, quote, baby talk. You remember that? Baby talk, kind of when she was working with the kids and stuff, I guess, huh? <laughs> I never saw that either. I'm sorry I didn't. But I don't remember hearing either of them, but of course as a pastor, there's a lot of things that go on in your parishioners' places that you never hear or see. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Doesn't surprise me in the least, though. Maxine was a true Christian lady. Not because she talked about it, but because she lived and longed to be like her Christ, her Lord. For he was the one that she adored the most. She touched our lives. She shared our tears and smiles. She just found ways to love us. We will truly miss that. And we will truly miss her. Thank you, Lord, for the life that you lived out in your servant, Maxine. As the Bible says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from henceforth. <clears throat> What's the rest of it? For their labors cease, but their works continue after them. The influence that Maxine has had on our lives will indeed live as we live to honor the, her memory and her influence in our lives. We do so to bring glory to her God. We have uh, deacons at hand with roving mics uh, for any of you that would like to uh, say something on behalf of Maxine. You're more than welcome. And all you need to do is raise your hand and someone will bring the mic to you. Hold it up close to your mouth with these masks on. You, you might want to take it off uh, to be able to speak. And um, with a personality like Maxine, very special person, uh, I know that things that would be said would be meaningful to the family.
say something. I didn't know Maxine that long. She's only been here for three years. But she was the most loving person and giving person. And one time I asked her if she would tell a children's story. And she says, no, I'm too old for that. I don't do that anymore. I said, oh, please, Maxine, I've heard you're a great storyteller. Okay, I'll do it for you. I wouldn't do it for anybody else asked me, but I'll do it for you. And you know, she didn't mean that. <laughs> I know whoever would have asked her, she would have done it. But that was just her way of making you feel special. And I know when I had her as a prayer partner in prayer meeting, no matter what I would say, she always had something richer and more sincere to say about me. In other words, Maxine was always one to make you a very special person. Amen. That's very true. And, and I like the way her friend said that she was grace and mercy. That is just exactly what she was because Anyone that needed help or that hadn't come for a while or might have come that, that Sabbath at church, she just made them feel truly welcome. And we noticed that even when our family would come, our kids from out of state, uh, Bob and Maxine both were always just right there to make them feel like they were part of us even though they were visitors. And uh, just a personal note, um, I always admired the way Maxine dressed. She was just so stylish and was just looked so well put together. I guess we women notice those kind of things. And I appreciated that. Um, she reminded me of my mom a little bit in that way. And I told her that one time. And I, she just was uh, 
she was just loving and just so kind and we all need that more in our lives don't we and she'll be missed nanny as we finally called her took care of me quite a bit when i was little when robert was little seems like we both took tumbles down the front steps but i remember falling down the steps and scraping my knees and nanny picking me up the next week i fell down the same set of stairs and scraped them again and then as we grew up um, nanny participated in my bridal shower that was held at the Klein's house. She and Papa Bob did a skit that had everybody in tears because they were laughing so hard. And the contents that fell out of Nanny's purse was just the cake that took it off. And then when I had Holly and I was bringing her to Sabbath school, Nanny was up in the Sabbath school with uh, her two granddaughters Ashley and I can't remember the other one's name she told us that Holly could call her nanny so she took the second place as Holly's second grandmother and through the years she would keep up with me and she'd say how's Holly and when Holly went away to college she'd send her notes and cards and she truly cared about everybody she will truly be missed by everyone she's touched. But what a blessing it was to have her in our lives. Nanny, like Willa just said, she would always find me wherever I was. She would give my address and send me letters and always tell me how proud she was. And her, everything she sent me was always on special stationery. This stationery always had horses on it. <laughs> when I moved to this church, um, I've been here almost five years, and I've been to this church for many, many years. And um, she always gave me warm and And I always appreciated her smile and coming up to me. And then when I became head deaconess of the church, she always had encouraging words to me, always came to me and said, you're doing a great job. And I, I say, I don't know about that. She says, no, don't you say that. She said, you're doing a wonderful job. I'm proud of what you're doing. And I so appreciated those encouraging words to me that she said, you're just about the good work. You're doing a great job. And she So that walked the church door. I so appreciated her as a, a Christian sister. Maxine was the most beautiful person, and I, I am just so grateful that I had the chance. I come to Wilmington as soon as I came, what, 24 years ago? when Nicholas was a baby and she was one of the first people that just welcomed me and she was always so loving and Maxine was kind of my partner in crime when it came to the remodel of the church because none of you know but now I can say it that <laughs> I don't know if you remember all those bookshelves up in the ba balcony and we had stuff from the 1960s up there and it was me and Maxine and a bunch of trash bags and I would say, Maxine, I, I don't think we should get rid of it. Throw it away. Get rid of it. You know, and she helped me clean out so many closets. And I would always hesitate and say, I don't, I don't think we should get rid of this. She'd say, get rid of it, honey. There is no need for it. And she was always helping me and always loved me and my kids. She always asked about me. She never forgot my birthday ever or my children's birthday or my husband's or our anniversary. I always got a card. I always got a tie. Uh, um, the 
bulletin if we weren't here. And um, she used to call me her Yankee daughter. And I just absolutely, absolutely adored her with all my heart. And I can't wait to see her one day. I said I wasn't going to say anything, but I, I need to. Miss um, Maxine was just so special to me. I just remember when we came to this church about 16 years ago. I knew her before that because I met her down at Myrtle Grove. She came to some of our health seminars, and I think I did see her break out in one of those dances. I, I can remember it's been almost 20 years, but she was such a lovely person, just so warm and so lovely. I remember when my sister passed in 2007, um, this church just rallied around, and Miss Maxine was the head deaconess at that time, and um, she sent me the most beautiful card. I just read, I found it the other day, and I read it, and it was just beautiful words that she And so I'm just thankful to have known her, she and Mr. Bob, but Mr. Bob told me something one day about dressing, the way she dressed. I loved the way she dressed, and one day I had worn this dress to church, and I had seen Miss Maxine with that same dress on, and I really was like, well, I'm going to wear it. And I never saw Miss Maxine wear that dress again. <laughs> it's okay. So I knew that I was a fashionista because she had that dress. But Mr. Bob said, <laughs> he said, you must shop where Miss Maxine, where Maxine shops. And I said, we do shop at the same place. And he said, well, I should have owned stock in that company. So I hope that you did buy some stock in that company. I do. But anyway, I love both of you so much. And just um, she will always be in my memory and my mind and my thoughts. And my prayers are to all of you for your loss. But just know that one day we will see her again if we keep Jesus close to us. Because I know that I'm not, I can't wait. I can't wait to get my hug again. So God bless you. We've only been here about 10 years, but Maxine and Bob were some of the first people we met. And in the last several years, I'm the prayer leader, and we've started this woman's prayer after church. And Maxine is always there. And we have an ongoing list. But I do want to say, on that list, I have Robert, and I have Kimmy, and I have the grandkids. And every Sabbath, we would pray for you kids and the grandchildren, that the Lord would watch over you and keep you. And your mom and your grandmother really want you guys to know how much Jesus loves you. And we look forward to Maxine being in that great resurrection morning when we can join with her again and praise the Lord. Amen. I just want to, uh, I always knew, you know, Bob and Maxine were warm Christian people, but their real selflessness came through when during the hurricane um, I was working at the hospital and after a couple nights they said you can't stay there anymore and it was, I-40 was closed and it was three hours for me to get home to Rocky Point. And so I called Bob and Maxine and they said, yeah, no problem, come over, you can stay here. And um, when I got there, Maxine's legs were terribly swollen and I just felt, oh, I don't know, this is real imposition, but they were I mean, they were so gracious and kind. They let me stay there, I believe, two nights. And I was really up against it. I really had nowhere to go. And uh, it, it was just showed me their real, true uh, Christianity and their selflessness. I was, I was really impressed by it. Well,
love and actually enjoy this church. Um, I wasn't very old, but I can remember it because I was baptized at St. Hyde. And um, Kim and I were, uh, and Claire were all about the same age, and they actually lived in this, we actually lived in the same neighborhood. So um, I have a lot of war stories um, of their house, and uh, I spent most of my waking hours there because I had six brothers and sisters, and I didn't do anything to get out of my house. <laughs> I spent a lot of hours there, and um, I can tell you that one thing, that woman loved you and loved you more than anything in this world. She had done anything to give you what you wanted and needed. And she had also given you anything to know that she to know that she's going to see you again. Mm -hmm. All of you. I can remember when Kim was dating her first husband, who's Matthew's dad, and uh, I was jealous because he was so good. <laughs> <laughs> he lived in the same neighborhood with us, and she and I, that wasn't the first, it was the first time. The, the second time was, Maxine and Mama always went to Pat, I always went to Pathfinder stuff with us. We had a huge Pathfinder group, probably 25 people at that time. And they always went with us. And Maxine was out there learning to march with us. And Mr. McClam was out there barking orders <laughs> and of teaching us how to march. And uh, it was so much rain that year. We were at Mount Pisgah. It was so much rain in here. And I can remember Kim and I having a fight in a tent over some stupid boy that she ended up getting. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't even remember. He rode a little bicycle around with a little spot of light. You remember it. But this church I know will miss her very much. And mom. And um, you know when my husband died 12 years ago, she Little people know this, but she was one of the rocks that I leaned on. And, you know, Gary and I met three years later and got married. We started coming to church here, and then we ended up transferring to Myrtle Beach. She, she would send him cards and say, I pray for you. She knew he was studying with George. She would send him cards, and she'd call me, and she'd say, that's Gary. I remember when um, Miss Maxine was at the hospital, Esty and I went to see her, and we thought we'd find her laying down in bed and all that. She was so happy and bubble up, and when we got there, she's like, you guys look so cute, and then she started talking to us, and, and I was surprised, I'm like, Miss Maxine, but you are sick. She's, no, 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 I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> And we just laughed, and we took pictures with her, and she was posting for us, and Mr. Bob was there, and he was just laughing and looking at her. And um, each time I would feel like down, because I'm a single mom, and it's really hard sometimes, you know. And she was like, you're doing a good job, don't worry. Just keep going up, you're doing good. We don't, as a mom, we don't, have a book under our arm to know how to teach the kids and all that and mm -hmm. and each time I feel kind of down you know with being a mom and doing things that I thought they were wrong she's like no 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 just let's just pray and she always pray with me and, and anytime I was able to stop by and she opened her door for me and opened her heart and and always with loving and and kind words and and loving arms and, and always
always supporting us and especially SD and I really appreciate all her um, advice, her support and everything. If SD is going to the academy today, it's because Maxine really got us through that. And you too, Pastor, thank you. Thank you all for your kind remembrances. And uh, those things will stick in our memory for those of it knew and loved her. At this time, Deborah McGee is going to sing a requested song from Maxine. Thank you. 
I don't think that there's much that I could add. And uh, maybe somebody would appreciate if the preacher would just sit down and be quiet. But um, I also have things to say about Maxine. Um, when I was a child, I used to ask my father to tell me stories of World War II. Uh, this was when I was very young when he would tuck me into bed at night. And sometimes he would lay down next to me and he'd tell me about the things that happened at Okinawa and other places where he fought. He was a signalman on a, uh, on a ship. And so he was just steps away from the bridge. He got to see everything. And he always, he liked that job for no other reason. If the ship went down, he had a chance to survive. The ones that were below deck, no chance to get out. But he talked about the Japanese kamikaze pilots that were, that were coming in and how the bullets were raining down on the sea, splashing in the water, in the chaos. I always liked stories like that. Daddy, tell me about the war, you know? And he didn't tell me everything. And after I went to war, I found out why. When I was in school with my classmates, especially in high school, I would take every opportunity along with them to get our teachers distracted by telling us stories of their life. Many of them were former missionaries, and they would have a lot of interesting things to say and things that they wanted to say. And so if they were telling stories, they weren't teaching us the lessons. But we found out later that we still had quizzes and examinations and were we responsible for the things in the book. Maxine always loved my telling stories in my sermons. One Sabbath I was preaching through the book of Ephesians uh, in a series, and I didn't have a story that week, and she accosted me in the foyer. <laughs> and she let me know in un no uncertain terms that I had to have a story. And so, I haven't preached a sermon since then without one. I'm not going to share this message today without one, too, just because of her. Whether we, you need to sit here and listen to it or not, you're going to get it because it's a way of remembering her. In my opinion, Maxine had the rare gift of exhortation. It's one of those gifts. That's, there are three places in the New Testament. Um, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4, where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are enumerated. The only place I could find it was in, uh, was in, I believe it was Romans. I didn't write it down in here. But nonetheless, she had that gift. I've had church members in other places where I've served that have had their, that gift, and they are the glue that holds the church together. Whenever someone's discouraged, whenever somebody needs a lift, she, she watches people's faces, and she can tell, and she knows, and, and those that are unappreciated and unnoticed, she appreciates them, and she notices it, and she tells them. Whenever someone needed a kind word or a homeless person would show up while she was a uh, community service leader, she would always help them. And she wouldn't ask for a remuneration most of the time. Most of the time she didn't. This all reminds me of a character in the New Testament. His name is Barnabas. It's probably someone that you're not that familiar with. He's not one of the big heroes. It's not like the Apostle Paul that kind of bursts on the scene and writes a third of the New Testament um, and gets a lot of attention and dies a bad death, having your head removed from your body. But Barnabas was an interesting man. And, and whenever I tried to share a message based upon somebody that, uh, that I knew real well, um, I always feel like I need to pull some sort of message from their life and find it in the Bible. And so I think I find her in the Bible in the person of Barnabas. The Bible is, after all, a book of stories. Everybody loves stories. Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Daniel. Everyone's life is 
a, sor a, a story. Maxine's was no different. I'm so glad Bob persevered in his efforts to win Maxine. He told me the other day when I was at the house, he told me that Maxine used to drink. Now, she doesn't seem like the kind of person that would, that would necessarily do that. But she would drink, and he finally would give her an ultimatum, and they were dating, and she drank again. And he warned her that the next time was strike three, and she was out. But she drank again. And of course, he recognized her quality nonetheless, and he gave her grace. And I'll bet he is glad that he did. When we take a look in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, we see that the name of Barnabas is son of consolation. Barnabas was a Levite that had become a believer. Uh, and he was one who owned uh, a great deal of land. And he sold it all and put it, as they say in the book of Acts, at the apostles' feet. Because a lot of people were losing their jobs when they became believers. Uh, they were being shunned from society. And they had no means of feeding their families. And so this was the method that was set up, that everybody held in common what everybody had so that everybody could get by. Of course, the mention of that is just prior to the place where we find the story of Ananias and Sapphira that promised the sale of a piece of land. And then when they sold it, they only gave part of it after the Lord had gotten them more than they expected. So Barnabas was quite a, an honest man. He was the first, if we look at Acts 9, verses 26 and 27, he was the first to trust Saul after having joined the apostles, all of whom were deathly afraid of him. He was a persecutor of the church. Barnabas had this gift from God to be able to recognize a person's true spirit. And he vouched for, for Saul that we later called Paul. And we find that mentioned. And then we see later on when they were trying to put together mission trips, uh, missionary journeys, that Barnabas uh, went to Tarsus to get Paul and bring him back because he had something in mind. And then there was a meeting one day of the disciples. Uh, we can find this in Acts chapter 13, if I can turn over there. Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 2. After, uh, chapter 13, verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, this is talking about all the apostles together, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to do. You know, it's interesting, if you use the gifts that God gives you for him, and Maxine certainly did, the Holy Spirit gets involved. And God even speaks on occasion, right out loud. And so that was the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. He and Barnabas were sent by God uh, to Asia Minor, and there they went from synagogue to synagogue, from town to town. They were accepted in some places. They were, they were fiercely rejected in others. Their lives were at stake in many places. Apostle Paul gives his own testimony about being whipped uh, with leather thongs, being beaten with rods, being cast into the sea, shipwrecked, about being betrayed by brethren. And he went through all that, and, and, and Barnabas went through it as well. Then there's something in verse 5 that's interesting. It's a part of the story that Maxine I'm getting to. And when they arrived in Salamis, 
they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their assistant. This isn't the, uh, the Apostle John. This is John Mark. This is the man that wrote the first gospel. But John Mark was young. He was probably a teenager at the time. He was very young. He sees these two men that he's with getting beaten, getting thrown out of town, being stoned at one point, and he says, I'm out of here. And he took passage and went back to Mom in Jerusalem. That's part of the story. We know that Maxine was an encourager, like Barnabas. Lastly, not quite lastly, next to last, Saul and Barnabas fell out with each other. Paul was a, or Saul, as he was known, was a kind of a rough guy. I mean, he expected a lot because he gave 110% all the time. And he expected anybody that he would work with to do the same. Barnabas, they were ready to go to another missionary journey. They were going to go to Greece this time. Um, and Barnabas saw potential in young John Mark, and he wanted to take him. It was his nephew anyway. It was his sister's son. And he wanted to take this man and to train him for ministry. Paul wouldn't have anything to do with it. He said, I'm not going if this young guy is going to go along with this. He's just going to make things more difficult. And so Barnabas took Mark, John Mark, and went to Cyprus in 39th verse. You know, Maxine, as I think I mentioned earlier, was community service leader for our church off and on. Um, she and Margie used to trade being head deaconess. And uh, it was back and forth and back and forth. We've had a few others since then. Um, but they were the, the stalwarts, the regulars. Um, and then when one of them was out of that office, another would take another uh, church board office. Um, Maxine was always willing to take responsibility after church. I don't know if you know, but in a church like this, located like this, after the service is over, there's always people looking for the pastor. They're always needing something. And if I spent all my time doing that, I'd never greet people. I'd never uh, spend time with the visitors. And so she took that off my hands. And I can't tell you how much it meant to me because I don't care a lot of money around in my pocket anyway. If I gave it to them, it wouldn't be as much as they would need. And Maxine would always take care of that for me. She was dependable. And it was really, really meaningful to me. Near the end of Paul's life, while he was in prison in Rome, waiting to be executed, the, mo the one thing that he could do, he could not travel, but the one thing he could do was write. And many of the books of the New Testament were written from the dungeon. Paul wrote Timothy while he was awaiting execution. And this is what he said. Bring back Mark for me. Because I see that he is profitable to me now in my ministry. Barnabas saw that when no one else did. Barnabas took care of it. He mentored this young man, and he prepared him to be the one that would write the first gospel written for the Christian church. Thank you, Barnabas. I think about what would our church be like, and I guess we're going to be finding out now without Maxine. Maxine and Bob are the heart and soul of this church. I haven't had anybody disagree with me about that. Nobody disagrees with that. They're so wonderful. We celebrate them being here. And you know, Maxine went through so much in recent years. I, how long was it? It was like three, three and a half years or something. She had nonstop problems physically, physical ailments, one after the other. And she kept coming through and I kept telling her, Maxine, we need you. We need you. Why do you need me? I'm just an old woman, you know? I said, there's something special in you that God's put there. And we all love it and we all need it. She was a jewel. She was a jewel. My story is called Mrs. Warren's Class. 
Many of the stories I tell are only a couple of pages long. This one's about two and a half, so it's not too long. But I thought it was a story of encouragement that perhaps could illustrate the effect in somebody's life of someone like Maxine. I, I've seen her encourage young people uh, that perhaps had been irresponsible in a lot of ways. She looked past that. She was looking for the value in the soul. She was looking in the significance of that person as an individual and as they would become and not as they were now. One of the great joys in life comes from watching a troubled young person turn and go in a new and better direction. What causes such a thing to happen? A miracle? Sometimes forgiveness? Maybe? Always? Tom was a char charming child, as most rascals are. But he was rebellious, a prankster, a rule breaker, a flaunter of authority. By the time he entered high school, his reputation had preceded him, and he filled most of the teachers with dread. He took a special delight in disrupting classes and driving teachers to the limits of their patience. At home, he also was a problem. There were frequent confrontations between his parents, uh, between the parents and him, each one seeking to prove he was more powerful than the other. So many complaints were filed against him at the high school that the principal decided he would have to expel him. Unless a teacher named Mrs. Warren would agree to take him into her class because she hadn't been tested yet. Mrs. Warren was an exceptionally capable English teacher, but she also was a loving, endlessly patient woman who seemed to have a way with problem students. Yes, Mrs. Warren said she would find a place for him in her 11 o'clock English literature class, and also in her homeroom. She listened calmly as the principal read from the list of Tom's misdemeanors, a long list that had the principal shaking his head as he read. No, Mrs. Warren, no, Mrs. Warren said she wouldn't change her mind. She would accept him into her class. When Tom was transferred to her class, he behaved as he had always behaved with every teacher. He slouched in his seat in the last row and glared at her, daring her by his attitude to do something about him. At first, Mrs. Warren ignored him, usually the best thing to do. Then as the class began to discuss the reading assignment, Tom whispered a joke to the boy in front of him, making him laugh out loud. Mrs. Warren looked up. Then she closed her book and stood and, and placed another chair next to her own desk. Tom, come up here and sit with me for a while, she said. Not, a, not seemingly as a, reprimand, uh, a reprimand, but as a friend. It was an invitation she was offering, and her manner was so sweet that Tom couldn't refuse. He sat next to her as she went on with the lesson. Tom is new in our class and hasn't had time to read the assignment. So if you'll bear with me, I'll read it aloud to him. With Tom next to her, sharing her book, Mrs. Warren began to read from The Tale of Two Cities. She was a fine reader and captured Dickens' sense of drama magnificently. Tom, for all his determination to be an obstruction, found himself being drawn into the text losing himself in the unfolding great story, sharing the excitement of it, who really seemed to care about his interest in the book. That evening, he startled his parents by sitting down without any prodding to do his homework. Well, at least for Mrs. Warren's class. That was the only the beginning. Tom never missed another day of school after that first day with Mrs. Warren. Sometimes he cut other classes, but never hers. He sat in the front row, participated in discussions, and seemed to enjoy reading aloud when he was called upon to do so. His appetite for reading suddenly became voracious, and he asked Mrs. Warren to make up a list of books she thought he might enjoy in his free time. After school, he stayed in the classroom when the others went home and had long talks with Mrs. Warren about the things he had read and the ideas they stimulated in him. Tom wasn't exactly an angel in other classes, but the effect 
of his behavior in Mrs. Warren's class began to rub off a little, for which all the other teachers were grateful. Tom didn't finish high school. In his junior year, after an angry outburst at home, he defiantly joined the Navy. This is interesting, isn't it? I'm always amused by this. I can't stand the authority at home. I'm joining the Marines. <laughs> Jump out of the frying pan and into the fire. He didn't even say goodbye to Mrs. Warren, who was sad to see him leave because she thought she had failed. Seven years later, when Mrs. Warren was closing up her desk one afternoon before leaving for home, a young man came to the doorway and stood there smiling. He was much taller now and more muscular. And Mrs. Warren recognized him. It was Tom. And he rushed to her and hugged her so hard her glasses slid down her nose. Where have you been, she said, adjusting her glasses and looking at him intently. My, he was so clear-eyed, so seemingly happy and self-confident. In school, he said, laughing. But I thought, sure, you thought I was still in the Navy. Well, I was, and for a while, I went to school in the Navy and got my GED. It was a long story he had to tell. Thanks to the Navy, he was able to finish high school. And then he went on with the GI Bill to college. When his enlistment was up, he got a job and continued his education at night. During that time, he met a lovely girl. And by that time, he graduated, um, by the time he graduated, he was married and had a son. Then he went to, on to graduate school, also at night. Well, what are you doing with your fine education? She asked. I'm a teacher. I teach English. I teach it especially to the type of children who disrupt other classes. Tom had never forgotten the feeling of acceptance he had had from the first day in Mrs. Warren's class. More than all the threats, all the arguments and confrontations and punishments, he had known her forgiving love got through to him. Now he was passing that love on to others. He had learned the give and take of kindness and acceptance. Like Mrs. Warren in the story, Maxine had a manner that made us feel good about ourselves. She was like the glue that holds together all relationships. It was not, it will not be known until Jesus comes how many will be in the kingdom because of her. So I've concluded my message as I have since that day with a story about encouragement, just as she wished. Let us thank God that she lived among us and has left a legacy pointing to Jesus as the lover of imperfect people. Because to be honest, that's all he's got to live with. That's all he's got to work with. That's all he can succeed with. Like Tom in the story, we may well be better than we would have been without Maxine. Jesus lived in her. Let's pray. We thank you for the life of Maxine Hines. If she had not lived, our lives would be poorer. She was not rich in earthly goods but is rich beyond measure in the memory and affections of all of us who knew her. Judge her gently, Lord. She had her weaknesses, as do we all. 
but her love more than makes up for it. We ask that the goodness that was in her heart might continue to live in our hearts, that the Savior that she lived for might be seen as well as heard about and believed because it was genuine. We ask that you would be with the family, with all of us that will feel less for her passing. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we separate, uh, there may be those of you that would like to go to Green Lawn Cemetery for her internment, which you may. Um, if you would wish to visit with the family here, you may pass up here in the front. Uh, they're on the second pew back, and uh, it, you're welcome to, uh, to greet them and to express your sorrow and your loss. Um, and then those that want to go on to the cemetery for the interment are welcome to do so. Remember the masks. I'm going to be putting mine back on. And uh, I wish we didn't have to do this, but it's the conditions under which this church is able to be open.